Hey guys, I am Dr. Zandra Palma. I'm in my office here in Parsley Health in New York City, and I want to talk to you a little bit about how the gut and the brain talk to each other and how they're related. Uh, there's an old Chinese medicine saying that is fire in the gut, fire in the brain. And there's been a lot of research lately that shows that pictures like depression, anxiety, ADHD, OCD, all sorts of different mood disorders, some are at least to some extent originating from inflammation created in the gut. Um, there have been some really interesting studies uh, showing that both anxiety and depression in different studies, and these are experimental models, these are peer-reviewed clinical trials, so it is the highest standard of science. Um, studies that show that uh, supplementing with probiotics actually decreases anxiety or depression. In the cases of anxiety, uh, it worked in 60% of patients, which if you think about a condition that's caused by many different factors, it's very multifactorial, a 60% decrease just from taking probiotics is profound. So we know that the gut microbiota, the microbes that live in the gut, are communicating with the brain. So how does that happen? It happens through something called the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve connects from your brain, it's actually the 10th cranial nerve, and it goes all the way down through your heart, tells your heart to beat, innervates your heart, and all the way down to your gut. It's what creates the migrating motor complex, the MMC, what allows the gut to move. So the vagus nerve is mainly parasympathetic, if you ever heard of parasympathetic tone, uh, which you can increase by meditating. It's also how we get the gut to move. And we used to think I was taught in medical school that information flowed from up here down to here. So the information flow was basically downward. Our brain told our gut what to do, and our gut did it. But we're just learning now that the information also goes the other way. Uh, somehow those bacteria in our gut, and we actually don't know how yet, are communicating up to our brains. So if there's inflammation, if there are the wrong species in there, that inflammation is going up and manifesting as mood disorders, manifesting as brain fog, manifesting as ADHD. And we know this because in those same studies where they found that probiotics actually are able to alter and reverse depression and anxiety, when they cut the vagus nerve, those effects go away. So we know that there's some communication going up. So yeasts communicate up. Yeasts are particularly bad for brain fog. Uh, bad kinds of bacteria communicate up. Parasites can have some communication up. Any inflammation, even food-related inflammation in the gut um, from food intolerances or just foods that are bad for everybody um, or herbicides, pesticides, environmental toxins, all of that can create an inflammatory picture and the inflammatory uh, chemokines and cytokines can not only go up through the vagus nerve, but they can communicate through the brain, through the blood and, and the entire system. Um, we also know that the damage does go downward. So, uh, and, and improvements go downward. So just like I said, that nerve, that vagus nerve, is a parasympathetic nerve. So the parasympathetic nervous system is part of the autonomic nervous system, the nervous system that works by itself. Doesn't, you don't think to make it work. There's two sides of this system, the sympathetic system and the parasympathetic system. We used to call the sympathetic system uh, the fight or flight system and the parasympathetic system the rest and digest system. These two guys cannot be turned on at the same time. They're mutually exclusive. So if you're in fight or flight, you can't rest and you can't digest. So for those of you who can't digest and are constipated, you need to turn, you need to turn off this fight or flight switch to get into the parasympathetic mode. Meditation is the best way to do that. We also know that people who have traumatic brain injuries almost immediately have changes in their gut function. We can almost immediately see a change in that migrating motor complex, the thing that allows for peristalsis. So you might see that somebody has one brain injury and has a history of IBS or different gastrointestinal problems from that point forward in their life. And we have to do a lot to reverse that. And it's not just traumatic brain injuries that can cause a change in gut function, even traumatic emotional events. So this is documented throughout the literature. Somebody can have a traumatic event in their life. Uh, you know, they, they lose their job, they lose their sister, uh, they have a bad breakup, and they have gut issues from there forward. And it's not just that parasympathetic, uh, the sympathetic and parasympathetic issues, it's also a longer lasting stress hormone called cortisol that works systemically. And we know that cortisol not only alters that gut function in terms of the, the nervous system, but cortisol specifically alters the microbiome. So having a high level of cortisol around will change the kind of bugs that like to live in your gut. And it'll make them, uh, make the composition look more like 
the gut of an unhealthy person who has constipation, diarrhea, bloating, abdominal pain, all these GI issues. So this, all the stuff I've been talking about is, is a term we kind of throw around in, in a field called functional medicine called the gut-brain axis. If you want to read more about the gut-brain axis, there are a bunch of scientists putting out great literature. Um, I know Dr. David Perlmutter is releasing a book on it this year, and there are a lot of societies, scientific societies specific, com specifically committed to studying the microbiome if you want to read more about how the microbiome influences brain health. Uh, and vice versa. Um, you can go on PubMed and look at those papers if you're a sciencey person. If you're not a sciencey person, I really admire Dr. Stephen Gundry's ability to explain all of this stuff in the most simple terms, so check him out. There's a third part to this axis that I haven't talked about. Uh, it's the gut-brain-skin axis. And if you have problems in all three, say you've got ADD, eczema, and IBS, that's always a red flag for me. I always start looking around in the gut when I see all three things going on. If you've got psoriasis, depression, and chronic constipation, I am gonna look in the gut because when I treat that gut, the other two are gonna get better already without me doing so much intervention specifically there. So maybe we can keep you off of probiotics by you know, figuring out that you have a yeast overgrowth or treating a parasite or realizing that you have a food intolerance and taking out that food. Um, so, start in the gut, it's a very good place to start, and work with your doctor, they can help you with all this stuff. And be mindful about how your thoughts in your brain also talks down to your gut if you have an intrinsic gut issue. And meditate! Don't forget to meditate. What tests can I take to figure out if I have a gut issue? So, it takes some clinical intuition to know which test we should give you first, because most of these tests are out of pocket, so we like to only give you what you need. So definitely work with a doctor who can figure this out. I wouldn't try to go ordering these tests for yourself. But the following uh, issues are really highly correlated with uh, the symptoms, the brain symptoms, and the skin sym symptoms we've been talking about. Uh, you could test for a condition called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. It's basically bacteria living in a place in the gut where it's not supposed to live, the small bowel rather than the large bowel. We can test for that with a breath test. We can test for imbalances in the microbiome in the place where it's supposed to live, the large bowel. Uh, we can test for the presence of yeasts. We can test for the presence of parasites. We can test for inflammatory markers in the bowel. And that's all done through a specialty stool tests that we run, um, where you take your own stool and you send it into a lab. Press. Uh, we can also test for products of bacterial breakdown and yeast breakdown in the urine. Uh, that's a urine organic acids test, and we can also test for food intolerances really well with a food inflammation test. Um, we do all this testing here and several other gut tests. I uh, would not recommend trying to get and interpret by yourself one of those direct consumer microbiome tests that species the microbiome, both because uh, some of the methods they use are iffy and we're not sure if they capture only live species or live and dead species uh, and to not have somebody take you through it you're just not going to know what to do with it and we don't know if all that information is really treatable just yet anyway so it's a very complicated picture work with somebody work with your doctor and if it, it not just you don't just have to investigate this if you have a gut issue. You may want to do some of this in investigation if you have either a skin issue or a brain issue, and especially if you have both, like I mentioned before. For example, 90%, over 90% in the studies, of people with rosacea have SIBO. Now that's a correlation study. It doesn't imply causation, but a lot of those people did not have the symptoms of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. It was found incidentally based on this study when they looked at it because they had rosacea. So skin, brain, think about testing the gut. If you don't know what the microbiome is, <laughs> very briefly, it is the community of bacteria, but not just bacteria. Often there are weird things in there like yeasts, molds even, parasites even. Uh, anyway, the community of organisms that live in our GI tract. Ideally, they only live in the large bowel, the colon for the most part, and ideally they're good guys. And these good guys make most of our vitamins for us. They transform our vitamins into the active forms of the vitamins. They make these factors called short-chain fatty acids that actually feed our brain and allow for cognition, eliminate that brain fog picture. They protect our main barrier to the immune system. So our main interface with the rest of the world is actually the gut lining and they protect that so they actually are the immune system. A lot of scientists 
in the field that studied the microbiome actually kind of think of us as these automatrons that are just being driven around by the bacteria that lives in our gut. And, you know, the science is kind of there. If you look at uh, mouse models, their social behavior is actually influenced by the composition of their gut microbiome. So read about it, there's super interesting science there. All right, so if you can't see a doctor right away, let's talk about the top three things you can do to start healing your gut by yourself. The top three things you can do to um, also influence your skin health and your brain health through your gut. Um, the first thing is to figure out what you're reacting to and eliminate foods that cause inflammation. So I would recommend just a, a good standard, high nutrient dense paleo diet. Um, and I would also recommend that you do an elimination diet leading up to it so that you can identify things that aren't working for you. And when you bring things back, really be in touch with yourself and notice if those foods are causing an inflammatory pattern for you. If your depression got better, but it gets worse when you bring back rice, for example. Second thing you can do, get on a probiotic. If you have a skin issue, if you have a brain issue, if you have a mood issue, if you have brain fog, OCD, ADHD, depression, anxiety, bipolar, you should be on a probiotic. We don't play in the dirt anymore. We don't dig things out of the dirt and accidentally eat dirt. We're not exposed to bacteria all the time. Um, so it's just a, a fact of our modern life that we're not getting enough diversity of the bacteria that we seed our gut with. So just take a probiotic if you've got any of those problems. Third thing you can do is pay attention to gut barrier function. We didn't get into this much here, but there is something called leaky gut which is when the barrier of the gut is permeable. So too many things are getting into and outside of the body going transversely through that gut barrier. Um, you can uh, address gut barrier function not only with prebiotics, sorry, not only with probiotics and prebiotics, which are the food that probiotics eat, uh, but with simple foods like bone broth, foods that are high in glycine. You can use aloe, you can use L-glutamine. Um, bone broth is my favorite. You should be drinking maybe half a cup of bone broth a day over the course of a week, uh, or even more if you can get it. It's great for you, great for your gut. 